is on uh, with Summit Labs. So they're going to be doing a little uh, training on stagnant water. So this is a good seminar. I'm trying to think of the word there. Uh, they did this for CBRE a few months back, and that had a good turnout. A lot of questions that, and you'll you, you'll see how important it is to pay attention to the thing. So being in this environment where we don't have people in our buildings, and that, uh, there's a lot of areas these guys are going to point out that you're going to you're going to say, crap, I didn't even think about that. Uh, some of the stuff that was obvious, you know, everybody's been taken care of, but. They're going to point out some more. So, Mike and um, Phil, I appreciate you being here. It's all you guys. Thanks, Chris. Um, just briefly, I, I just wanted to let you know my name is Phil Rapp, president of Summit Laboratories. It's been a little while since we've been involved in BOAC. I had a couple of interactions with Craig, and he reminded me of some things. It's like, these guys shoot guns, they go out and whack. <laughs> golf balls around, they go fishing, camping, drinking. It's like, hell yeah, we want to be a part of this again. <laughs> yeah. So, but anyway, uh, uh, we, we appreciate being here and the opportunity to uh, share a topic with you today. Mike's going to do that, Mike Haddock. And uh, I'm going to back him up and uh, we'd encourage uh, some interaction, questions along the way. This isn't a formal uh situation so i'm going to turn it over to mike here and uh, uh and let him cover the topic hey thanks for having me everybody my name is mike haddock i've been with phil here at summit lab since november of 2018. Uh, i hold a few different degrees in science environmental resource management geology and recording engineering funny enough uh, <laughs> I'm currently working towards uh, earning my CWT, that's a Certified Water Technologist Certification. It's the highest certification we could earn in our field. Uh, a little bit about Summit Laboratories. Phil founded Summit Labs here in Denver in 1986. Uh, they've, we've been blending our chemical in-house since then. Uh, we have over 400 customers in Colorado in different market segments, including commercial HVAC, light industrial, heavy industrial, power plants, uh, food processing, and then some of my favorites, breweries and distilleries. Uh, all of our, like I said, all of our chemicals blended in Park Hill in Denver, and all of our deliveries are made to the point of use by our delivery personnel. So, I mean, it doesn't show up on your dock, and then you have to handle it. Our program takes care of all of that. And so, so today we'll be talking about stagnant water and commercial systems. Uh, we'll have the slides up here. So. What we'll be talking about today is stagnant water in, in commercial buildings and the risks of uh, microbiological issues in those systems. So I'll, I'd like to just go through and outline what we're going to talk about today so things are a little bit clearer. Okay. <laughs> but, but before we get started, uh, I, I want to point out and make sure it's clear. When we would come give a presentation on Legionella, we'd typically be talking cooling tower systems. That is not what we're talking about today. We're talking about potential risks of Legionella bacteria in stagnant water in commercial buildings. Okay, just make that distinction. So we'll get started with a, a background in uh, in these microorganisms and how disinfection disinfectants help take care of that issue. Uh, before it gets to your building. We'll talk about Legionella bacteria. Uh, what is Legionella? We'll talk about uh, affected building water systems. We'll talk about the impact that COVID-19 has had on all of our buildings. And then we'll get into what we need to do to minimize this risk, uh, what we can do to, to, to get rid of or, or help mitigate this impact of Legionella bacteria. And then finally, we'll summarize with 
what can we do to validate our efforts in, in, in minimizing all those risks? Okay. I think it's about oh, back up on there. There you go. And, and, and so, uh, you know, a background on, on disinfection. One of the things that we need to keep in mind is tap water isn't as sterile as you might think. Tap water is not sterile, okay? Tap water, yes, it is. It does contain chlorine disinfectant. It's provided by the city. Um, but once that water makes it to your building, those chlorine levels begin to degrade, okay? There's a few different factors that, that relate to that. Temperature, the time, the materials, the construction, right? Uh, but under, so, so what we're going to say is under normal flow conditions, this chlorine makes its way out to the end of all your lines, and it, it's generally not a concern. Uh, it keeps control of all those uh, microorganisms that can cause us trouble. But these aren't normal conditions. We're talking about reduced occupancy. Some of our buildings have no occupancy. Uh, I don't think we've ever seen anything like this in our buildings, perhaps ever, right? Uh, and, and so some, some more background here. I just want to talk about heat for a moment. Heat can be both our friend or our foe, all right? The heat drives off chlorine in that system. So this leaves your domestic hot water systems exposed and vulnerable. It, it's a potential risk to grow this Legionella bacteria in those domestic hot water systems. But I said that heat can be our friend. Uh, Temperatures above 130 degrees kill off these microorganisms. And, and, and that's really the key there, is to keep that hot water loop hot and flowing throughout the building, right? And so now, a little bit about uh, Legionella bacteria. Legionella bacteria is a, a common bacteria in our environment. The, the ones, there's a few different serotypes that we're concerned with that cause the Legionnaire's disease. Uh, now, getting into Legionnaire's disease, it's a respiratory disease. So the key here is that a, 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 a droplet of water needs to be aerosolized and inhaled into your lungs for this Legionnaire's disease to take hold. Simply drinking water that has Legionnaire's or Legionella bacteria in it is not going to cause Legionnaire's disease. It needs to be aspirated and into your lungs. Okay, so see here, there's a 30% mortality rate again amongst high risk groups, the very old, the very young, and anybody that has a sort of immunocompromised uh, system. Uh, so, so where could we find Legionella? Where do they like to live? Systems with dead legs, older buildings that have had renovation work, you know, a sink is moved, uh, a room's renovated, they remove the sink, there's a dead leg behind the wall, nobody's trimmed it back to the main, it's just capped off behind the wall. Uh, systems with low flow that allow biomass slimes to grow. Uh, this is an area where Legionnaire's disease or Legionella bacteria can flourish. In, in, with this low flow that we're seeing, we see the domestic hot water loops set to cool off because we don't have the flow dropping below that 120 degrees mark. And then in dirty systems, so along with you know your old systems or, or low flow scenarios, uh, allowing those suspended solids to fall out and sit in the bottom of the pipe. And so here we have uh, Building system or building water systems that could be affected by uh, Legionella and they pose potential risks. So, of course, your domestic cold water, your domestic hot water, cooling towers, uh, different water features, fountains out in front of your building, perhaps, uh, pools and spas, you see misters occasionally, uh, bottled water dispensers, fish tanks. Uh, does anybody have showers in their building? Those are definitely a potential risk area. So that's something that you'll want to take uh, extra precautions with. And, and like we said earlier, it's any system that can aerosolize water. So 
put the droplet of water into the air and make have the potential for it to be breathed in to your lungs. And so you're going to see, uh, it's the co what, is, what impact has COVID-19 had on our building? Well, it's obvious, our reduced occupancy, our safer at home orders, uh, everybody's working from home. We don't have this occupancy in our building. Nobody is running the water, right? Uh, the slow building occupancy results in low water use, low flow, and stagnant conditions. Uh, we mentioned earlier, low flow allows chlorine to degrade, so sediment settles in piping. This low flow allows for your domestic hot water to cool off. Uh, these are all issues that can be that can be minimized, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, and then going into comorbidity, meaning if somebody has COVID or an immune compromised system or sick with some other issue, they're at a higher risk to contract Legionnaire's disease uh, versus some of us that are perfectly healthy probably get away. So, so what can we do uh, to minimize this risk? This is what, we're, what we really need to talk about. Uh, it, it's simple as flushing our systems. We need to get fresh water with this disinfection to the end of the line. That's the main point of the story right there. Uh, <laughs> these distant fixtures uh, are around our facility can be identified, you know, bathrooms at the end of the hallway that might not be used, any sort of hot water recirculation system that's far away from the main, right? Uh, what we need to do is we also need to pay special attention to those systems that aerosolize water. We were talking showers, and fountains and the like. Uh, there's some other things that we can do to mitigate risks in these, uh, you know, water fountains, uh, pools, spas. Uh, they can be chemically treated, uh, and we can help with that. Um, and, and then you'll see here fish tanks. You want to keep those locked up. Just make sure nobody falls. <laughs> And, and so, what are we going to do to, to validate our efforts, right? We've spent all this time, <coughs> we spent all this time identifying low flow areas. We sent all this water down the drain because uh, we're flushing our systems. We're making sure that, that no water stays stagnant in the building. Uh, but, but what can we do to validate the effort? Uh, and this is as simple as running tests. Okay, we can, can help with that in identifying and coming up with a logical area to test out. What are our biggest offenders in your building, right? Uh, stagnant, stagnant lines at the end of a, of a run, your domestic water systems where you're not getting that hot water flow. Uh, we can come up and help you with the program with that. Uh, if testing is easy, we, we take the sample off and have it, have it uh, run locally at a lab. Uh, testing costs between $100 and $200 per sample. That's just depending on really how many we have to come out and take uh, to make sure your building is, is, that you're minimizing the risk correctly. And then those test results come back in about seven to 10 days. And so if there's anything else, uh, any questions that maybe I can answer? Well, that's a good question. Um, so, so we've all seen the the, the infographic. If somebody sneezes or coughs, you get this big cloud, and it, it goes a lot further than anybody might have imagined, right? So let's uh, let's compare that to maybe a sink. Okay, and you have an area in sink then. Uh, you open it up, that water hits the basin of the sink, aerated, and you get this big cloud of uh, small droplets that go up into the air. So you could be standing right on top of it and breathe it right on that one. 
get water vapor, any, any sort of aerosol, uh, any water that's aerosolized, shower heads, uh, misters. I think, we're, I think we're all experts at this point in the past year on how things can spread so easily, uh, you know, you might not realize. Um, so this topic is not a real complicated one. What, what we just went through kind of summarizes uh, the issue. It's something that, um, you know, when I was talking to Craig, he felt it was important to be aware of. I mean, you got so many other things going on in your buildings these days, especially the last two or three days, I'm sure, with the temperatures being what they were. But as, you know, the year unfolds, um, I guess we're all going to find out how it is and when it is that people start showing back up and that the systems throughout your building come back to a normalized state of operation. So the water, stagnant water, low flow water is not anybody's friend, whether it's on the potable side or the domestic side or on the process side of things. Let's say, you know, your cooling system, if you have a cooling tower and water cools come in through and stuff. On that side, low flow is always a corrosion issue. And yeah, you can grow bugs, but we're kind of used to growing and controlling bacteria <clears throat> in open condenser water systems. This potable side of the whole thing uh, can kind of sneak up on, on folks. Um, we service quite a number of healthcare facilities, hospitals, uh, you know, throughout the state. And they're the ones who are kind of, uh, I guess, make this a little bit higher priority than maybe a commercial office tower um, or some of our other sites do. Um, but given the circumstance in the last year, I think it elevates the risk a little bit and that uh, it's something that you should be aware of. And um, once again, maybe to be redundant, um, the best tool that we have in our arsenal uh, and the one that doesn't really cost much except for some time, and maybe some water, is to flush uh, and to know your systems uh, your domestic water and realize that whatever, this, this, this section of the building, these people have been gone for six months, they're not using the restrooms, they're not, they're not using the water. And to be aware that <clears throat> some sort of a regular schedule of flushing, and you could validate this effort of, of flushing water by maybe uh, using a chlorine test, which is a very straightforward little color change kit to make sure that as you flush, that you're achieving the goal of getting the disinfectant, probably gonna be chlorine, out to that end, out to that point of use. You could do it before and after and, and realize that, you know, we lost our disinfectant while it was sitting around for a couple of weeks. So, and, and when that happens, obviously you can amplify bacteria issues and the one, you know, most worried about is Legionella. Um, so I guess maybe my question would, would, would include is, is anybody doing this currently um, as far as any kind of protocol for working your way around your buildings and, and making sure that these systems are getting some exercise or um, what, what's the sentiment on that? Or, I know I've got a, a high rise downtown the central riser is a trimmer, but you figure on each floor I have at least one to five, probably dead legs, because they're going to go to a, a break room um, and different things. So one of the questions I have is we were looking at flushing by tenant as they come on board, but if I've still got dead legs in the riser, that says it and basically, do I need to flush it all, even if I only bring one tenant back? Well, you can have riser activity as you flush the floor, right? I mean, correct. I always so, have riser activity. Yeah. Okay. But each floor is basically its own potential dead leg if the tenant's not there. Right. Right. So as soon as I start running water on the floor, as long as it doesn't come back. 
I'm not adding it to the rise. Yeah, I mean, well, that would be the benefit of flushing is basically flush and waste right. and, and hopefully carry any uh, issues with you if there's bacteria that goes down the, down the drain. Um, we haven't done a complete building flush where we've done the sanitation at this point. Right. Well, I mean, the more diligent, I, I know you got other things to do, <laughs> um, but the more diligent and the more frequent, uh, I think that you would get the more benefit from flushing. Yeah. Because um, so we're trying to draw the line as to what's the building responsibility versus the tenant. Am I yeah. going to flush their coffee pot? Not the mine. That's in end equipment, the refrigerator filter. I can get the sink, I can do all that. I can look potentially look at the water heater. Yeah. But uh, there any equipment where I used to change the top and shoes. It's a little bit of a it's a little bit of a challenge, isn't it? Um, the uh, to think about. Um, I would I mean I don't know if the tenants are aware of this, but I mean if it was a tenant's responsibility before I brought my employees back in. I would probably uh, solicit for a uh, Legionella test at a couple of, you know, maybe random sam uh, fixtures or sample locations and get a sense for if there's any eminent problem. Uh, and then you'd have to, you know, come up with an action plan from there. Um, whether they got a positive or a negative test back or not, the flushing would be a good idea. I mean, you know, for other reasons, maybe the aesthetics of the water might not smell right or taste right or something like that after sitting around. But I know that they, there aren't too many places I hope that have been sitting around literally stagnant for a year, you know. There are. I mean, I've, literally, I've got tenants in the building that want zero people in our state. Uh, even you, even me. Even fire truck. Wait. Yeah. Uh, just bring bottled water. No. <laughs> Actually, that isn't the point. But anyway. Yes. If you do get a positive test, what is the next step? Yeah. Well, that's the Pandora's box, isn't it? Uh, yikes. We got a positive test. So there's a, um, there's a couple of options. It depends on the building. Um, number one, you're not likely to get a positive result on the cold water side. Um, although with the stagnant, that changes that dynamic a little bit. But typically where we see uh, Legionella turn up on sites <clears throat> is on the hot water side. So that temperature zone that a lot of hot, especially in hospitals, because they have to kind of quench or limit the temperature by, reg, uh, I forget which regulation it is, they can't scald their patients, you know, uh, so they have to keep their temperatures down on their research domestic hot water. That's a problem, big problem. But commercial building probably not held to the same requirement. And so if you got a positive test and you had the ability to crank up the heat on your hot water side to let's say 140 degrees. So there's different timelines if you were to go to 140, what would be the kill time zone? So you're about 30 minutes at 140 degrees. Flowing. Flowing. <clears throat> and that's to each fixture to, to kill off that bacteria. You and you wouldn't have to you wouldn't have to be full blast. I mean, you just need to be moving some water. Uh, if you can get it up to 150, it's like it's almost instantaneous. Yeah. <laughs> so obviously there's a uh, there's there's a relationship between time and temperature as to how quick you uh, kill off uh, bacteria in your system, which kind of makes sense, right? So, um, but you might need to do that in the middle of the night. Yeah. So that you should try, you should you try doing that in the hospital. <laughs> yeah. You should try doing that in the hospital. Uh, it's full of patients. It's a it's a disaster. It's a nightmare. So with hospitals, I'll just go off on a tangent here slightly. With hospitals, they don't want 
to encounter the problem. So on the front end of things, they will implement maybe a secondary disinfection strategy where as the water comes into their site, there's, there are strategies to add and dose, let's say monochloramine to their water, which is a, you know, a, a registered disinfectant for the purposes of potable use. And they'll run that as a secondary to the chlorine that's coming in because, you know, with sites like that, their systems will sprawl. And, uh, I, you know, you may have 0.3 ppm coming in off the, off the tap. They get three quarters of the way through their building and it's gone. You know, there's just things that degrade. It. So uh, the end of their line, you know, uh, uh, so they're, they're pretty aware of that. That doesn't come into play <clears throat> quite so much in commercial buildings because of the nature of its use and, and how, how water is used in the different applications. So, um, so to answer the question, the other thing that can be done, again, if, uh, if you could uh, thin out the occupancy, I mean, we do this all the time. Mike is the man for our construction. For full building chlorination. Yeah. Where we would tap into the, the main water supply coming into the building and then send our disinfectant out through your entire domestic network and test for it at each individual fixture throughout the building. Yeah, it gets a little involved. We, uh, you know, we do this all the time with construction though, because it's, uh, it's kind of a state mandate that you get, uh, that you sterilize the building, the, water, the, the domestic water systems throughout the building and then you you take samples to the state they check for e coli and coliform either give you a thumbs up or a thumbs down and you're good to go but yeah uh, that's the way it works with new construction it's very tedious it's uh depending on <clears throat> the site how many fixtures you have you literally are supposed to go through and run high levels of disinfectant what 50 ppm, 50 ppm of chlorine and let it sit once you've Confirm that it's throughout your site. That it's sit for 24 hours and then flush to make sure that all that chlorine is gone at that time. Yeah. So that's. You can do that with an occupied building. No, you'd have to do that, you know, on a weekend or something. And I know that things aren't completely unoccupied, but that would be the other, you know. So those are the two primary things is heat it up and flush it and then test it afterwards, or if you had to go ahead and hyperchlorinate and flush it and test afterwards. So it's not, there's, there's no easy way, is it? <laughs> uh, it's hard enough to like uh, uh, flush out your RV each season, you know, uh, just think about a, you know, 700,000 square foot office tower. <laughs> So to avoid the problem is really, uh, you know, preventive is the way to go. Uh, so that's circling back to <clears throat> trying to uh, uh, identify the risk areas and flush, flush, flush. Anybody with showers, um, you know, in, in, in the healthcare industry, you know, they, there's a lot more Legionella fatalities than maybe people are aware of. Um, it, it, it mimics pneumonia and what, how many people don't get diagnosed? I mean, it's pre-COVID, but most of the older folks or immune compromised people end up dying of pneumonia. Check the box on pneumonia. Um, Legionella mimics that. Uh, and so I don't think it always gets diagnosed, but uh, I think the, the primary uh, culprit is their shower heads. So, you know, it's not the cooling towers. The cooling towers are usually located on the roof. There's nobody nearby. The plume is gone, off and gone. Um, but, you know, the showers in, in a hospital, the, the water is not nearly hot enough to inhibit, you know, you can uh, amplify the Legionella bacteria and that's usually what happens. So anybody who has shower heads, that would be the point to um, test for too. I mean, if you were just coming up with 
uh, you know, we have 500 fixtures here. Oh, we have five shower heads. We should probably take a look at those in the locker room. You know? So, uh, you know. How many heads are you guys doing with all with the COVID? You know, with COVID happens, are you doing a lot more tests with COVID? Uh, so, in, once COVID, once we got hit with safer at home orders and stay at home orders, We've had an influx of these tests. Uh, it seems as though if, if something comes up in the news or a tenant gets wind of, you know, microorganisms growing in your water supply can be an issue, all of a sudden their ears perk up and they want test results. I, I think one of the, we haven't seen um, a general increase in requests for this. But that's kind of why we're here, is because I don't think the awareness is uh, probably there. Um, so I don't know. I might see a few more test requests showing up. But um, but generally, Legionella and uh, uh, the whole issue as it relates to commercial office buildings um, is something that is growing in awareness and growing in urgency, maybe. Although healthcare is up here, commercials down here. There's a there's a standard, there's an ASHRAE standard 188 that came out several years ago. Now we have a standard. It's like your air in the building, it's like your electrical in the building. It represents best practices. And so the lawyers, you know, now have something to bludgeon you with if and when you have an incident where you where you know. Where's where's your water management program per ASHRAE 188? It's like, huh? Uh, you know, I wasn't aware of it. Blah, blah. Well, I don't know if that'll stand up too well in court. Um, so people need to come up to speed. It's unfortunate. It's, it's not as if you people in this industry don't have enough to do and to comply with and all the rest of it. Add this to the list and a... Uh, water management plan has quite a bit of front end headache with regard to documentation, like a lot of other, a lot of other things in this category. So um, any building with a cooling tower qualifies for this umbrella that would fall under ASHRAE 188, along with other qualifying things. Buildings. Healthcare has their own category. Um, buildings over 10 stories. Yeah, yeah. It, uh, so, so anyway, this is another uh, aspect of it. And, and water management programs definitely include your cooling tower, but the good part on that is that if you're running a uh, reasonably uh, uh, sound water treatment program on your cooling tower right now, you're, you're you're checking the boxes on what's needed for that. What's surprising is how much is required on the domestic or the potable side of your building, because they want you to identify you know, your, your backflows and this and your that and everything that would need to be flushed normally, whether we're in COVID or not, um, any kind of dead legs and so on. So, um, so it's a matter of awareness. Mm -hmm. So if we do have like shower heads and stuff like that, would it be best just to take the shower heads off, flush it, and then put it back on? Well, so we don't aerosol it. It depends. <laughs> yeah. um, no, yes. Are you trying to trying to get a positive or a negative result? Well, I'm just saying you're you know, flushing it out. No, I here's a good. I mean, that's a great question. Um, if if it were my building and we hadn't used the showers for a while, I would remove the shower heads and I'd probably put them in a, a pail of a weak bleach solution to make sure that surface is not harboring a problem. And then I would flesh the heck out of the stuff, you know, coming up to that head. But how hard? That was a good one. How often do you have to flush these systems? I mean, let's say people don't go back to work for a year. How often do these buildings need to be doing it? 
Well, we, we talked about this. It's like, uh, there's no specific protocol uh, that anybody's gonna latch onto, you know. Um, so it's, it's unfortunately, it's kind of a subjective thing and it's site specific as would be a water management plan. ASHRAE does not lay out everything you need to do to minimize Legionella risk when you build it because it's so site specific. <coughs> no buildings are the same. So, All right, and so like with Steve's instance and the, the dead leg caused by a, a tenant that won't let them in their facility, that is still connected to your recirculation system. And that bacteria could make its way into your riser. So uh, it, it wouldn't be right to say, well, this isn't gonna be occupied for one year. Let's not flush it until a week before they come back. You're still harboring you're still making a safe environment for that Legionella bacteria to grow in that leg, and it could potentially make its way out to your riser. Um, it, again, it would have to be a case-by-case -case basis, but uh, regular flushing is what, we're, what we are asking for. Yeah, as, as, as regular as practical. Okay, and order? Yeah. 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 Choice is shift. <laughs> <laughs> No, Listen, you're talking to a water guy. We're going to go over the top on all this stuff. But um, um, the, uh, uh, well, oh, I know what I was thinking. Um, you know, as, as often as practical, I mean, if you got if you got the operators and the engineers to just get used to, if they use a restroom, go around and, turn them and just on. turn them all on and flush everything on the way out, you know, and or uh, enlisting the help of the janitorial staff um, if they could be kind of water hogs when they're going around and doing their thing, the more the merrier, um, you know. So, um, and I'll I'll admit that in facilities with the hands free, uh, well, <laughs> water faucet that does complicate things. Uh, to be able to stand there and you, you can't walk away from that faucet. You do have to activate it and let it flow. Uh, believe me, in these construction jobs. And, and help with the new hospitals. Uh, you have 50, 60 of those at the place, and you have to stand there and turn the faucet on and let it run, and turn the faucet on and let it run. For and how it is, long? And it is difficult. Well, in my instance that I refer to in the construction project, I, I'm testing directly for the clarion at the sink, so I do it until I see it. Uh, but in an instance at, at your building, uh, until water is hot, uh, until that water has achieved the, the it's about the best you can do. It. Like you said, if, it, if you get it up to 150, that's the most instantaneous. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So all you have to do is test the test water, cap the water to your uh, exactly. Yeah, and, and you know, similarly, your hot water and your cold water loops. If you've got a long run, uh, you can feel when the water temperature changes on the cold water loop uh, to what was stagnant in the pipe to what's fresh coming in. Coming city, right? You can get that cold temperature. Same with the hot. Uh, let it run until it achieves that temperature that you target. I'm not going to want to touch it. <laughs> right. No, you better use the uh, trigger for that. Uh, Do you need to be now when you're doing this? Well, well no, that's a great one. You know, the, the answer would have been an odd response mask. What are we going to get a mask? Where are we going to get a mask? You know? <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, I think that'd be prudent because, you know, usually you're blasting water into the basin of a sink. You can bet, like, like Mike described, if you could see that, you know, it's, it's, it's around. So, and it is a respiratory, you know, you can take a bath in Legionella laden water, you can drink it, you know, guys, we're all, you know, around tower sumps, cooling tower sumps. That isn't the problem, uh, it's it's the plume. And I always recommend, we've always recommended that when you're working around your cooling towers to at least have what we used to call a painter's mask. Now it's an N95 and we're all experts in respiratory diseases, but the, uh, um, so yeah, uh, I think we're, <laughs> The whole hygiene thing has gone from here in this country to here, and it's probably gonna stay about there, is what I think. Um, we're all Japanese now, you know. <laughs> so, um, yeah. 
Um, on one of your slides, it said the test results are about seven to 10 days. Is there a way to, to rush those a little faster if someone was under the gun and didn't have that, so much lead time? So the, the culture takes time to, uh, to mature so, so that the sample can be read. Uh, although there are some technologies available that, we can, that can be tested on site, uh, this is this is very, very analogous to COVID. You get a rapid test, but the accuracy isn't there. Uh, if you want to see, if you want a CDC elite uh, uh, culture result, which is going to be pretty specific and accurate, uh, yeah. What they do is they take it, they identify uh, that there's bacteria, then they have to concentrate it, then they have to separate out the zero group that that is the troublemaker. There's only, there's like, there are dozens of different types of Legionella bacteria, not all of them are threats to our health. So they look at for the ones that are, and then they concentrate those and come up with a result. So all that, yeah, it, it takes time. So, yeah. Any other questions either? Or are we fielding anything? Nothing, from Zoomers? Yeah. So the Wait, you Zoomers speak up. So kind of the, one of the simplest ways then is the chlorine test to, to see how much chlorine you have before. Yes. All right. You know, I think I think as far as building goes, and as far as let's say from a liability standpoint, if you're doing that, and you're testing for chlorine, and you're logging your results. Let's say every other week, it's like, yep, we got 0.3 of this and and that. And just have that documented, it would show that you were putting forth some sort of diligent effort to uh, to prevent a problem. Yeah. Versus you're sitting in the uh, courtroom and say, well, you know, uh, uh, City of Denver Water District uh, sent out a notice, you know, said, you know, you need to flush your systems if you have stagnant water. How, how many times did you do that? And, Where's your logs? You know, it's like, you know. So it, that's a, that's a, that's a factor in all of this, obviously. But, uh, liability exposure. But good question. Thank you. Right. I had a question. Uh, how many operates have the baby called animal? Humidity factor. So I shouldn't say that humidity is a big factor. Humidification. Well, the uh, it is it is a variable, and, and uh, you might not be aware of it because uh, you know we operate in one climate here, which is pretty arid. Florida, you know, you have a bigger concern, like in a Florida type humid, uh, you know, high humidity climate than you would in a desert or an arid uh, climate. However, you can't take that to the extreme and assume, and we're talking about cooling towers now, all right? Um, so Legionella, even, even in a dry climate, can evolve and amplify in, a, in an open condenser water system. I think, and it's, I, I really don't have a number or can't quantify how much more of an issue or a challenge it is in Florida than it is in, in Colorado. But relatively speaking, I think to your point, you know, we're probably uh, uh, less of a risk or less vulnerable here. But uh, I wouldn't, that wouldn't stand up, <laughs> you know, because we do have, we do have regional outbreaks. I don't have a number for you. It's not that frequent. Hey, I have a question. My name's Matt Urquhart. Um, I wanted to make a couple of things. Everybody, when they're raising their domestic water temps, just be aware of your code, because if you've got showers, temperatures can only be 120 degrees maximum with a tank heater unit setting at 140. So any discharge out of the faucets has to be below 120. So and the, the question I have is, in in domestic water heating loops, let's say for tenant sinks, where would you find the Legionella 
starting? Is it because it's a it's a aerobic bacteria, right? So it needs to have oxygen to survive. So would you find it in the lines themselves, or would you find it more um, at the spigots or you know the strainers at the faucet? Well, those are those are that's a good question. I'll make a point though that that Legionella is where it amplifies is in biomass and the biomass exists throughout the system in various places on the surfaces of whatever the material of construction is. Um, so it doesn't necessarily need as much oxygen as you may think, although, you know, uh, domestic water is oxygenated. So um, how much of that uh, uh, gets in through the biomass, I'm not sure. Where you're going to see it is where you can get to it for testing. You can swab test, uh, let's say, a shower head and get a result. You're probably not going to be able to swab test 10 feet into the line. So um, as to where it might be, obviously, uh, uh, the biggest risk would be at that point of use because that's where it's going to exit the system, aerosolize, and be a potential problem. So. Does that answer the question? Yeah, it does. Thank you. You bet. Thanks for bringing up the code. Are you are you a medical office building or a hospital, or is that code apply to commercial sites also? It it applies to the Denver City Building Code and the IFPC code for the nation, actually through uh, the um, building municipality code. So it's. It's basically for every residential and commercial office, whether it's hospital or not. Hospitals have specific codes that are in different municipalities, but the general UBC building code is 120 degrees yeah. max out of the faucet. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And that usually gets quenched down pretty close to the point of use, right? Yeah, they designate it based on the actual um, end device. So showers, they max out at 120, bathtubs, 120. Um, hot, uh, hot tubs actually have to be at 110 um, and different levels like that, but everything maxes out at 120 that, so you don't burn yourself. And if you run your temperatures higher, then you have to have um, individual devices, let's say at a shower control that actually has a scald stat built into it for, especially on units that have, you know, domestic water that's heated through the heating loop with a side branch control, you know, cause the heating loops yeah. are, can get up to 180. You have to have a scald control on those individual plumbing fixtures. A, a hot tub at 110 degrees, I think I would call that a lobster pot at that point. The uh, <laughs> yeah, those actually have to be 104, man. You know, yeah. there there is one in Pagosa that I think their hottest one is right around 110. Or they do call it the crab pot or the lobster pot, whatever. But that's too hot for me. <laughs> but um, this is where spas. Uh, hot tubs in, in motels and hotels are on the very short list, if not like number two for um, uh, associated with Legionella uh, fatalities. Um, I would be very cautious about jumping in a hot tub at, uh, at the Best Western. Sorry. I mean, you're, you're, anyway, <laughs> thanks for your question and, and your feedback. That was great. Ruben Ramirez, do you have a question for Phil? Hey, Phil, free to unmute and ask away. I know there's a question kind of in the comments, but I don't see anything more than your name, Phil. Oh. Hey, Ruben, you got, you got a question? Or Mike or Tom. <laughs> okay. All right, folks. Is there any more questions? Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Yeah.